Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 285 being recorded on January 28th, 2014. I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And uh, we have we had, we had out Alan Malvinton is not here. He is uh, attending to some personal issues on uh, the way to uh, his wedding day. Uh, you can see if you're watching the video version, you can get a um, kind of a Unabomber esque ish look of him. Apparently at an airport someplace, which actually makes this a little bit worse. I think. Also, his wedding outfit. Also, also what he's going to wear to his wedding. Yeah, so it's a little bit it's a little bit awkward. Um, so it's cold here. We're minus one person. So I don't think we had any big storage uh, announcements or anything this week. So we'll 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 canter on without him uh, as we move towards Super Bowl Sunday, which I think six six terabyte drive. Right, but I think that had already been announced. Oh, we were just discussing it, and uh, still you're just, you're just way six behind. terabyte drive. So Josh, who's going to win the Super Bowl? Broncos. By by how many points? The manatee picked the Broncos. You're my manatee, manatee. Which manatee is this? Apparently, there's a manatee with a perfect record for the last six years, or they just edit the video really well and <laughs> yeah. get to pick. <laughs> well, I'm rooting for the Peyton Mannings as well, so hopefully they will come through. Uh, I don't have a problem with Seattle. I think they're a um, a fine team, and uh, I think Richard Sherman is hilarious. So <laughs> I would like to see his post game interview. Either way, I think <laughs> it should be interesting for sure. For it's sure. Uh, so we're recording this live on Wednesday. We start at 10 p.m. Eastern time uh, at pcper.com slash live. If you want to find us and you want to watch us record it live, you can absolutely do that. And all you have to do is go to pcper.com slash subscribe. And if you do that, you get this handy little web page. It has a little description about it. And then ask for your name and email and the submit button. And all you do is give us your name and your email and you sign up for our mailing list. We will let you know uh, anywhere between an hour and 30 seconds before we go live uh, with a live stream, just depending on what the schedule is building up to that. But we will let you know when we're going live for the podcast or a, a, a GPU stream or a new product stream or special event or anything like that. Uh, we don't use it for anything else. Josh tries to get access to it all the time to spam his Josh check links out to, but uh, we're not letting him do that. So um, feel free to sign up for that. It will be easy and safe. So let's talk about some of the reviews that have come out this week. First up, a uh, quick mention to check out the uh, review lead post of the Corsair CS series modular 650 watt power supply. This is, as the name implies, it's not a fully modular, fully modular part. You can see here, you've got uh, probably uh, the ATX 24 pin, 8 pin, and it looks like maybe one of the PCI Express cables as well. It's a fairly low wattage, low, I guess 650 is not a low wattage part, but it's low feature set. Um, you can tell just based on the number of actual modular connectors there. Um, it'll probably give us a list here. He's got that on a different page. So, uh, but 650 watts, I think, I think most most PC users are going to be fine with that. It does have a, uh, a single 12 volt rail up to 51 amps. Um, so no arc welding jokes necessarily uh, for this power supply, I guess. Uh, it does have four PCI Express connectors and a, it has four of the four pin peripheral connector. Why do we call that? Let me just call that Molex. Is, am I wrong in that? I, ca I call it Molex. Molex yeah. Is that just... Ken, Ken says Molex is like a brand, so yeah, maybe they're I, not I think to Molex use is the name of a like brand, a name brand. Okay. of connectors. Fine. Six SATA connectors, one floppy connector. Ooh. So that's good. That's good. But they still call it floppy. They don't call it like accessory connector because you could use that for some older sound cards and stuff too. I think some um, like CPU coolers and stuff use it. Uh, it, it's a decent power supply. It's definitely a low-cost option. Let's go ahead and uh, sneak to the end here where he mentions that price, $109 uh, U.S. as of uh, January 2014, which is the current month, and uh, five-year warranty, which is nice. Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. The RM series has the five-year warranty. So this is uh, three, it is, which he lists as a minor weakness. Otherwise, a, a good power supply for not a lot of money. Um Corsair continues to pump out good stuff in the uh, power supply realm. So check that out. It did get a gold award from PC Perspective. Uh, you can tell because the picture is gold. And it's an award. And it says, and it award says right there. gold. It does say that. It does say that. Also up today is a 
story, review, whatever you want to call it, that takes a look at AMD Dual Graphics. AMD Dual Graphics used to be called Hybrid Crossfire. Uh, I don't remember when exactly they got rid of that nomenclature. Uh, it was, they didn't, I, I think with Lano, they still called it Hybrid Crossfire. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I don't know, Richland or Trinity, one of those, they decided to change it over to dual graphics. But it's called dual graphics now, but it's the same idea, right? You have uh, an AMD APU that has integrated graphics in it, and uh, you add to it a discrete GPU, usually a low-cost discrete GPU. And you combine the power of those two graphics processors, and you get better gaming performance as a result. Um, this was all good and fine through, like, 2011 um, because... Metrics like fraps and in-game benchmarks reported higher frame rates. As it turned out, because this is using Crossfire, the same technology that Crossfire uses, even though it's called dual graphics, um, it had the same frame pacing issues that we saw with like two discrete graphics cards in Crossfire. Remember the frame pacing issues, the whole frame rating story, um, runt frames, drop frames, all that kind of problem existed on dual graphics. And it actually, in some cases, is quite a bit worse than what you would, what we even saw on the desktop with like mainstream or high-end consumer graphics cards. So this was something they were working on. We happened to get a hold of a 13.35 beta driver from AMD um, that enables uh, Radeon Dual Graphics with uh, not just Kaveri, but Richland and Trinity. Uh, I don't know if it goes back into Lano or not, but uh, it's not just... Um, not just Kaveri. And then you have a little option in here underneath Radeon Dual Graphics where you can enable frame pacing uh, on or off. It is default to on, which is good, as it should be. Um, so what we did was I took the an A8 7600 APU, which is the same APU we used in our initial Kaveri review, and we added to it a uh, MSI R7 250 graphics card. This is a DDR3 variant. They have DDR3 and GDDR5 options. It's about $89 on Amazon. So it's a very low-cost, discrete graphics card. What's interesting about these two parts is that the A8 7600 APU has 384 shader stream processors, shader units, whatever you want to call them, uh, as does the discrete R7 250 graphics card. It also has 384 shader units. They just happen to be running at 1100 megahertz as opposed to 720 megahertz on the APU. And uh, I would assume the, the memory subsystem on the discrete card is still much faster than the uh, APU, right, Josh? Yes. Even though it is Easily. DDR3. Yeah, it's 128-bit wide DDR3. So it's running significantly faster than, what, 2133 or 2400? That... Gotcha. Yeah. All right. um, so let me, let me show you a couple of the benchmarks here. We'll show you uh, Battlefield 3 first. Um, if we look at these two graphs, th this is, if you're familiar with frame rating, you'll understand this, but I'll, I'll give you a quick... Quick refresher here. Uh, if you look at the pink and green lines, the pink line is the Kaveri APU by itself. The green line is the R7 250 graphics card by itself. So these two are the ones at the bottom. You can see the discrete GPU is a little bit faster than the APU, you know, a, a healthy margin, probably five frames per second faster or so. Uh, the black and orange lines up here represent the combination in dual graphics with either frame pacing on or frame pacing off. Frame pacing off represents all dual graphics setups before this driver was available. So if you're running dual graphics and this driver's not available yet, which it's not as we record this, uh, you are seeing the result in this graph right here, which is where the orange line representing this A8 7600 APU and the R7 250 graphics card uh, is actually slower in observed frame rate and experience than the APU by itself. And that sucks. Um, that's pretty crappy. Uh, but the good news is, is with this driver and frame pacing enabled, we see positive scaling, right? So uh, the black line is clearly above the green line, which is the, the discrete GPU on its own. And that's good news. So now this graph here uh, that shows frame times gives you a better idea of why uh, that's the case, right? So um, the orange mass is not just a background color. It's actually uh, how the frame times were delivered uh, before this driver and it's again it's it's, it's pretty pretty freaking awful um, this basically means that your frame times were going from basically zero which sounds great uh, all the way up to say 50 uh, 55 milliseconds uh, which is which is not great uh, the, the problem is is this back and forth meant that kind of basically every other frame was 
was wasted. Uh, the green and pink lines here still represent the individual GPUs, the single GPUs, and the black line here represents the improved pacing-enabled A8 7600 APU and R7 250 combination. And the good news here is this black line is... Um, lower on this graph lower being lower frame uh, lower frame times meaning better frame rates but the bar is also pretty well constrained right so uh, what you want to see ideally here is the thinnest possible band of color if you look at the green line here of the r7 250 uh, discrete card it is by it is it is the most consistent it has the most consistent frame times uh, it is the thinnest band of color the black line is not great but it's much, 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 much better than the orange line, which is not great. So uh, I consider this a huge improvement, uh, very, very, very playable, um, and no big issues with performance in that way anymore. You can see here, if we look at our frame rate by percentile, uh, the black line up here at the 50th percentile, which is uh, pretty close to the average, um, sees a bump of just above 30 to just above 45 frames per second, which is 34%, uh, I think, based on the math I did at the time. Um, so that's pretty good. And you can see the frame time variance uh, of this black line is higher than the pink and green lines, which is bad, but it's not horrible, right? We're not getting above, say, the four millisecond frame time variance level until the 95th percentile. So that's that's all good. Uh, Bioshock Infinite, uh, it worked fairly well here. You can you can definitely see that there's still some issue, like the black line here still spiking up and down. But if you look real close, you can actually see the pink line does it a couple of times as well. Um, so none of those games are perfect. The result of that is that you can kind of see that the frame per second percentile graph kind of has a, this weird droop at the end. Um, Grid 2 is an interesting title because it has a lot of CPU kind of bottleneck in it in some cases it's, it's kind of an odd an odd duck in terms of the engine that it's that it uses um the black line is definitely better than the orange line the the frame time variance is definitely better but it still could use some improvement but it does improve performance overall um just not by a lot skyrim is included here here's here's the downfall for this driver guys is that it still has the same problems uh, we'll say limitations as the other frame pacing drivers in that DirectX 9 is not supported. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, I'm pretty sure that if at this point we haven't seen DirectX 9 implemented on anything, it's not going to happen. Um, what's Elder Scrolls Online based on? I don't know. I don't know. Mm, you, you Wikipedia that, a, that. That could be a driver uh, for this. You could Wikipedia that. Somebody Wikipedia it. Um, and and the, here, here's why it's bad. Uh, this this graph shows you uh, the black and orange is both massed together on this on this image here. Um, meaning that there is no... Like you enable frame pacing and it says, nah, I'm good. They claim DX11, by the way. For ESO Online? That's what they're claiming. I don't well, know. Well, I, I, yeah, I didn't know. I mean, I, they may not be using the same engine, but uh, I, I would be curious if anybody in the chat room has any... Um, information on DX9 titles that are coming out or are out that are big now that uh, we should be concerned about and we can maybe go complain to AMD about that they don't have support for uh, proper crossfire scaling in there because Skyrim is definitely one of those titles um, but it's old right so we're trying to Let's give them newer options to complain about. Uh, Battlefield 4 is on here as well. It also scales pretty uh, or improves performance pretty uh, pretty noticeably. Uh, the black band here does seem to kind of degrade a little bit. You see these these spikes up and down here in the second half of this uh, in the second half of this this benchmark run. Still drastically improved over the orange mass with frame pacing disabled. Aren't or, or you glad? You chose that color, orange. Uh, you know, I think that was just yes, yes, I am. I'm, I was going to say that it was just happenstance with the scripts that we wrote, but that's probably still the case, actually. Did we? All right, good. Ken says I did that on purpose. Um, so, the A8 7600 Kaveri APU and the R7 250 dual graphics uh, pacing is fixed for the most part, right? If we if we kind of say it's fixed as much as the rest of AMD's Crossfire lineup is fixed, meaning no DX. Um, nine support, then it's fixed. And it's actually a usable, worthwhile uh, addition to the AMD ecosystem. And it's kind of one of those advantages that their APUs can now claim uh, over Intel's parts 
because, um, well, we'll talk about it in a second, but you know, I mean, the ability to like, oh, I'm going to build this mini ITX system. And as it turns out, the games that come out, you know, maybe you want to run at higher image quality settings and you can't, and you need maybe another 30% performance boost. You can do that by adding in this 80 or $90 graphics card. Now the, the question is, um, at what point, someone asked me on Twitter, it's like, well, hey, what if I have like a higher end GPU? What if I have like an R9 290 and I have a Kaveri APU? Do I get any advantage out of that? And you do not. Um, they actually don't even enable that. Uh, I think they don't enable this for anything over an R7 250 because at that point, um, the performance of the screen GPU would be so much higher than that of the Kaveri APU that forcing them to kind of communicate and work together actually lowers overall performance. So, uh, at what point is investing $90 in a graphics card to get a 30% boost in performance um, beneficial versus saying, hey, why not spend 200 and maybe you get a 50 or 60% boost over what your Kaveri APU is or 200 or 100% boost over what your Kaveri APU gives you. So it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of where that line gets drawn. And certainly uh, here it's worth noticing and uh, mentioning uh, you're just using the uh, A8 7600. It's not even the A10 7850, True. which has the two extra GCN clusters or compute cores, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. So, so it'll be kind of uh, interesting to see what that does when a dual GPU. Yeah, I have. I, when I wrote this, when I did all the testing for this, I did not have an A10 7850K yet. I purchased one and it came in um, late last week, I guess it was. So I was just finished, I think we just finished running some of the CPU based tests on it. So we'll do some of our dual graphics tests on it as well and see uh, how much better it is. But keep in mind that uh, even though the A7600 isn't for sale yet, there's a $70 MSRP difference between those two parts. Um, between the 7850K and the 7600, I think, 60 or $70. Um, 60 bucks. It's like 179 and 119 right? Right. So at $60, now you're now you're got to consider, uh, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to do this in the review, right? It, is the added graphics performance you get with the 7850 over the 7600 worth 60 bucks, Or is it worth saving that and investing in like the R7 250? you know, for $30 more if, if kind of mainstream gaming is your, is your target there. It's pretty interesting. I'm glad it works. Um, I guess, I guess that's it. Um, which you, any other thoughts on that, Josh or Jeremy or I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get a chance to, uh, just, just have a regular Bonaire based, you know, HD 7790 R7 X. Mm-hmm. Yeah, card. I, I think that that would be. I mean, that's a hundred twenty nine, hundred thirty nine dollar card. So, what do you get by just running that by itself versus yeah. a dual yeah. solution for an extra ninety bucks? There, there. The the problem with I say this all the time. The problem with the low end market is that there's always just like a hundred options you could consider. And we don't have the bandwidth to really compare at all. Because, like, you would like to say, let's take all those APUs by themselves and then all those APUs with all of the available uh, dual graphics parts and then compare that to all the individual GPUs above it as well. Um, it's, it's something that I would like to do. I, I just I don't know if our readers really want to know much more than which option do you think is best. Uh, and I, I kind of think that combination that we showed here was probably going to be the most cost efficient option um, to go. Although I do want to point out, if I if we look back at the second page of this story, we have this thing. Um, the APU here is listed at 139 bucks. Processor 44. The motherboard is 145 because we're using a mini ITX, but you can get a cheaper one if you go full size ATX or micro ATX. I think. Um, the memory here, uh, eight gigs of DDR3 2400 at 121 dollars. That's that's fairly steep, isn't it? Right? Because I mean, getting, yeah. getting memory for the problem AMD has with their APUs is that they see performance advantages with higher frequency memory, and sometimes fairly significant performance advantages. The problem is, is that becomes cost deterrent for the like low cost build, right? Ideally, you would want to buy like. $60 worth of DDR3 1600 or something like that. And that would save a huge amount of money on a low cost build, not a huge amount of money, but a huge percentage of your, of your bill. Um, and in fact, the memory that AMD sent is actually 16 gigs 
dual 8 gigabyte DIMMs of DDR3-2400. And that was like, how much was that? That was 250 bucks for that memory kit. And I was like, I can't recommend that to people. If you're buying a Kaveri APU to do integrated graphics on, that you should have 16 gigs of DDR3 memory in your system. Um, but you do need fast, high-frequency memory in order to take full advantage of uh, the, the, the APU architecture itself. So it's an odd, it's an odd position to be in, I think. Um, th the testing we did used a, an early version of the 13.35 driver. Those drivers apparently leaked this week, courtesy of Toshiba, I guess, which is where I get all of my leaked drivers from. And um, it was rumored when this news story came out that this actually included true audio and mantle support. As it turns out, I did a drastic, I did a thorough search of the installer that I had with my 13.35 drivers, and they do not have the mantle uh, DLLs in them. So it does not include um, support for mantle, although that's coming awfully, awfully soon, awfully soon. Um, what is in 13.35, the driver that I have, and uh, a driver that will be out, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you probably tomorrow sometime, maybe the day after, is support for phase two of frame pacing, for AMD frame pacing, which is like um, uh, uh, above 25 by 16 on Tahiti cards. So Ifinity in 4K working in 280X and 7970 Crossfire. Does that sound exciting to anybody else? Like... The crap we yay back in yay August. they've been promising that for ages and they actually <laughs> delivered it in a january time frame january ish <clears throat> i'm gonna go with january ish yes. um and it's actually technically still not out yet this was a leaked driver uh but it does have support in there for that so um the driver i had had it uh, ironically had some had i gotten that driver and somebody said hey, phase two of frame pacing is in there for like Tahiti and 7,000 series and 6,000 series cards. I would have spent my time testing that instead of dual graphics. Um, but I didn't find that out until after all of my dual graphics testing had been done. So I guess that's, that's what I get for just believing people. Um, we did mention the 7850K. Apparently this is an all AMD APU episode of the podcast. Um, the A10 7850K, I did get it in, and we did a real quick video uh, on comparing it to a Intel NVIDIA combination. So, um, the, you know, the, the APUs aren't great for processor x86 performance. What they're really known for is their gaming performance, and what AMD wants them to be known for is HSA and GPGPU compute and kind of heterogeneous computing performance. Uh, but still, the biggest selling point for APUs is what can you do on the gaming front with a single chip and a small form factor at a low cost? Um, 7050K is like 170 180 bucks, uh, and we priced out uh, kind of a, a similar Intel Core i3-4330, and then we took an NVIDIA GT, GeForce GT630, uh, DDR3 variant graphics card, which is about 30 bucks more total for those for that CPU and GPU versus the APU. And uh, we compared it on five games, which are eluding me all of the sudden. Um, but say again, what we got Bioshock Infinite Grid 2, Battlefield 4. Um, uh, we just, we like literally just made this video and I have no idea how we're, how we're missing it. Um, but you can see Ken made pretty graphs. Oh, Tomb Raider was one of them and Crisis 3. So those are your five games where we kind of say, what can we run at 1080p? What image quality settings can we run at and be 30 frames per second or above on average with the APU? And then where does the uh, GT 630 kind of stand in that? And the, and the differences are actually pretty impressive. In some cases, like in Battlefield 4, that difference is 49% which is a lot. Uh, and in Crisis 3, as the graphs go up, that's actually, waiting for it, 37%. Good job. Good job on the graphs, Ken. Good job. Um, so it, it, it's a short little video. It's, it's not a real in-depth analysis of anything. It's more like, here's our quick, we played five games on each system. Here's our result. Boom, go. And I, and I have to say, like, the quick takeaway is, for 30 bucks less, using just the APU, you're getting noticeably better performance 
than you are uh, with that processor and GPU combination. And I know that we could go into it again, like there's a whole lot of other GPUs you could use. There's a whole lot of other, um, you could maybe get a non-Haswell processor and save money that way and get a higher end discrete GPU and would outperform the APU and you're probably right there too. Um, and if we did CPU testing, if we were looking at you know, non, um, you know, graphics performance benchmarks, more than likely the Haswell processor would be, be the winner by similar margins to uh, what the AMD APU is doing. But uh, it, it was a neat little kind of one day project for us to kind of see how, uh, how AMD stacked up there. Isn't it kind of interesting to think that that uh, product probably comes close in performance to the old uh, HD 20, 2900 XT? Really? Yeah, because that's a 320 stream unit of mm. VLIW5. It's also like a power hungry beast. Really? It was quite loud, quite power hungry, yes. Yes, but you could crossfire it. <laughs> you could. I, I would like to go back and see how well that was frame paced. I've got one here. Do you still have one? I probably have two. Oh, I well, then just don't have any time to do any of that kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have an intern, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's not going to school this semester. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Got to do it for free though. Um all right, let's talk about <laughs> Let's talk about some news. Uh, AMD introduces two new low-power Opteron 6300 series processors. Josh, you want to about these? 6300. You know, they're the same pile driver based units, except that they've kind of optimized it a little bit more at the fab level so that they eat a little bit less juice per cycle. So you get some power savings with this. Otherwise, it's another, I think, 12 and 18 core product uh, running in between I think 2.1 and 2.3 gigahertz so it's uh, you know it's not anything really new but it is more efficient than their previous products by a small margin so they're still trying to keep their feet or foot rather in the server market <laughs> with these you know higher end high core products that that run fairly well against the competition and uh, certainly are priced to beat them. So what about the um, the 1100, the A1100 series of Opterons? Well, this, this is, is interesting. kind of interesting because uh, this is AMD's first ARM design that uh, they will be releasing. It's going to be based off the Cortex-A57 architecture. So it's a 64-bit server chip. Um, you kind of do have to do the in-air finger quotations when you say server chip because ARM is, you know, licensing A57 to anybody and their mother if you've got the scratch to come up with that. I do not. Really? No. You're not developing your own it's ARM bucks? chip? Is it 12 bucks? No. No. It's not. At least 15? Okay. All right. <sighs> I need about three fifty more. Anything else uh, special about this part? That yeah, we, it's that actually kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be low power. It's eight core. Um, it's a, a true SOC. It's got uh, eight SATA ports coming off of it. And it's got something like 10 gig E connections, or no, two by 10 gigabit Ethernet connections coming dang. off the board. What? I said dang. Dang. So it's got some serious throughput. You can stack all kinds of memory on it. Um, I think it said something like 128 gigs at max, but I think the boards that they're shipping first, of course, have like two DIMM slots, so you're not going to get anywhere close to that. Uh, What's but, the time frame of this? Uh, you know, they're sampling in a couple of weeks, hmm. and uh, I don't know when they're actually going to you know, get out true blue products with this, but um, you know, they're, they're using some of the C Microtech, the fabric, uh, right. behind this so they're you know getting eight of these little cores together and they're 64 bit things and they're low power and they're running about two gigahertz from what we what we see and and still they they just kind of sip power but they're uh you know it's interesting that they have that many sata ports and uh two 10 gigabit ethernet uh connections coming off that thing 
So it's going to be interesting Sweet. to see who buys it, who buys into it, who's going to develop for it. Will yeah, it I know, save you know, AMD other pundits in the around. server division? Yeah. What's that? Will it save AMD in the? Well, like, will it bring them back into a growth period in the in in the enterprise field? Well, remember Cal Calzada, they went belly up. Was that Superman's? So, was that Superman's father or? Close enough. Okay. No, they're the uh, the only uh, you know ARM server chip guys that they develop those kind of expensive boards for uh, you know blade servers, and uh, it was all based on ARM 32-bit stuff. And they kind of went out of business a couple of months ago, so uh, they left open you know a little bit of a niche. And with a true 64-bit ARM server processor, um, it opens things up for AMD. And again, they they've got the C micro connection. Uh, it's a small but valuable niche, or as Jeremy says, niche. 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 I think it's like how much cachet do they have on that? <laughs> yeah, I know there? you do that too. Cache, which is He's a word if you have a out of a T at the very end of it. Cachet. Cachet. Ca- it's French, right? It's a yeah. weapons cache. That's what my brother used to say after <laughs> Iraq won. Yes, we found a weapons cache. It's a cache, brother. Um, no, that was a weapons cliche. Mm, like could have been. Mm. Hey, Jeremy, let's talk more about AMD on this podcast. Um, apparently, there are four processors slated for this magical AMD A1 socket that we first saw at, I first saw at least, at CES. Yeah, you didn't share it with us, but you did see them there. We talked so, about it. Yeah. I mean, I didn't give you a board, but I we posted True. a picture of it. I think I may have talked about it on a podcast. On video, Ken tells me. Ah, yeah, it must have been when I was sort of snoozing. Yeah, no, I get it. But yeah, regardless, what, what you've got is two of the higher ends, an A6 and an A4. The A6 530, or 5350, rather, uh, and how much the A4 5150 have? both share two megs of L2 cache, a TDP of 25 <laughs> watts, and the same GPU, the uh, new HD 8400. With the 5350, uh, you're looking at a quad core running at uh, 2.05 gigahertz, whereas the 5150 is down to 1.6. Then you've got the two uh, lesser powered E2 processors, or sorry, the E2 and the E1. The E2 3850 uh, is again a quad, and just excuse me for a second. Still have that cold. Uh, it's 1.3 gigahertz. It's got a slower 8280 uh, GPU, but again, 2 meg cache and 25 watt TDP. Ah, and finally, we've got the E1 2650, the only dual core that we're seeing that's coming out. It's clocked actually higher than 3850 at 1.45 gigahertz. It's got a slightly slower 8240 HD on board, 1 meg cache, and again, 25 watt TDP. He said cash, not cash. He did. Yay. Yay. <laughs> You're corrupting me. You're crushing my English into some sort of Americanism. If only they had Zed Cash. Yes. Zed Culling. Um, yeah. This is, this is, uh, who's going to buy this? Like, I don't. I don't know. Socketed. Cabini. Cabini. Socketed Cabini with Jaguar cores. I mean, so uh, I'm gonna build an Xbox. On yeah, it, I guess I don't. I don't know. I guess we'd have to Mini see how, how good the performance is, but I have a pretty good idea. I can guess what the GPU performance is going to be. Um, also, this is an HD 8400, so maybe it's the future. Well, we still don't have that much on the HD 8400, do we? No, I mean, we've got I, rough I mean, specs. I mean, we we have a it's it's not much, right? I mean, no. it's you know uh, how much did the uh, the Bobcat sell? You know, like ASUS and MSI, they had those boards you could just yeah, buy. I don't know honestly. that had the, you know, I, I think they did okay, not fantastic, but okay. Now at least this, you know, instead of uh, the manufacturers saying, okay, well we got to produce X amount of boards using this processor soldered on it, and it's going to be. Uh, put in a very, very small form factor with the tiny power supply. Or we have to, you know, figure out how many of these higher level they might get and then another one. So 
instead of having to do big guessing game on what's going to be popular and what's not going to sell, um, AMD's given them kind of a, a chance to just make one design that'll handle each one of those processors. And uh, the users and the OEMs then get to choose what they do rather than just saying, hey, this, I can't even, the, the what, the E1600, that's, that's too much for us. We're going to go down to the single core E1300 or whatever. I can't remember numbers anymore. They're hard. Dementia, early onset dementia. It's, numbers are hard. It's okay. Yeah. But I, I could see Zotac putting in uh, an order for these for similar Z boxes so that you can choose do you want a Silvermont or do you want uh, one of these Cabinis? I mean doesn't it doesn't it just that like now AMD's got to sell these processors <laughs> right like they have to sell retail or at least OEM versions of those four parts and manage that inventory I, obviously they they they've done research and have decided that this will be a profitable they hope will be a profitable venture Right to create them in this form factor and send them out there, um, and well, AMD also odd. does some non-standard marketing too. Like uh, I'm sure you've flown enough to actually have seen a powered by AMD uh, LCD on the back of the seat in front of you, where you watched movies on. Maybe, but I didn't see that it was powered by AMD. I mean, I've, I've actually seen that on, on okay. the Virgin Atlantic flight right. uh, I don't that fly it took over to Scotland, airlines, and yeah, like on the way there. Totally said it was powered by AMD. Huh. So for that, or for like Vegas, uh, one arm bandits, that sort of point of sale stuff, mm -hmm. you might actually have an argument for this. But then again, at twenty five watt, that's a little toasty. Yeah, I don't know. it's 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 a interesting part. Not sure. Yeah. I would love to test it and see what its use case is, how low cost these motherboards could be. Because if you, if you looked at if you watch that video. Uh, that's on there. I talked about how thin that motherboard is. Like as soon as I picked it up, I was like, "Wow, this is a low cost board." Not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a low cost board. Um, Jeremy, it you just means it's simple and it doesn't have all that many layers. Yeah, it no, I necessarily mean low cost. Correct. Well, I would hope it would mean low cost. It doesn't mean cheap. It doesn't mean not worthwhile. Yeah, because right? you know, with only twenty five watts having to be pushed through there, you don't sure. need a whole lot of layers, and you it's a, a smaller lot of power pin count and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, you posted in here, uh, Intel Haswell iGPU Linux performance has regressed. This is a story that Scott posted up, but uh, what are they the, – what, what happened here with Haswell? Oh, well, it, it's been a sort of a Linux-flavored week in a bit. But essentially what the complaint is is that with the arrival of Haswell in the HD 4600, well, the brand new HD 4600 – is running about half the speed of the previous generation HD 4000. Sweet. So, and this is with the brand new 313 kernel. Uh, it was, Phronix was testing on Ubuntu 14.04, uh, and I forget exactly what they were using, uh, Exonautic. They were seeing ridiculously worse performance from Haswell. Hmm. So, with this brand new uh, GPU on board, it's just really not doing very well. Ivory Bridge, on the other hand, almost doubling its performance with the latest updates. Mm. So, you know, there's a little bit of work to be done, and there certainly seems to be a lot of work being done right now. But for right now, yeah, Haswell may be not the best upgrade if you're a Linux user. So, uh, continuing on, Linux kernel 3.13 uh, is good news for AMD. How so? Yeah, so maybe not so much for the Haswell users, but for Radeon users... It's actually a really, really good kernel update, uh, as he desperately tries to post links as well. Uh, but essentially what they were seeing is significant improvements to 7,000 uh, series and up Radeons, mm -hmm. not 1% or 2%, more like 50 to 60% in some cases, uh, significantly beating out uh, chips they couldn't even touch before. So not only do you get a raw power increase, but there's also some new features that have been added into it. One of the biggest ones that's been a huge complaint for a lot of people is that they fixed the HDMI audio out. Uh, with the Radeons previously, there were some issues where HDMI out would work for the graphics. Audio was frustrating, to, say, mm. to put it nicely. So they fixed this, and the other thing that they've added in is support for dynamic power management because... Windows users quite used to the f new features with the Radeons where they will clock themselves down and bring the fan speed down 
thus saving you power and a little bit of a headache. Linux hasn't really been supporting that on the new uh, cores, so bringing that in all of a sudden means that the Linux boxes are now seeing the Radeon's down clock like the Windows users are used to. So not only is it a speed update, but there is actually some major updates in the 313 kernel, which is totally worth checking out. Uh, which, which leads to the, the last and the trifecta of Linux stories this afternoon, this evening, whatever. whatever yeah, thanks, Billy. <laughs> so uh, we do have to point out that, well, AMD is getting a lot better on Linux and NVIDIA is slowly gaining, uh, perhaps not to the same way that uh, either the official Radeon GP, or sorry, Radeon driver from AMD or the Radeon SI Gallium 3D has been, but they are slowly improving, except if you're talking about OpenGL development. If you're talking OpenGL development, the 680 will stomp a 290. In fact, in some of the certain tests, an older GTX 550 Ti will stomp an R9 290. Nice. So, on the other hand, OpenGL, not so much AMD's cup of tea. Not very many developers' cup of tea right now because we've got a lot of other options out there. But it's still a valid uh, language and it's still being used. So, if you are doing that sort of development on Linux... You don't necessarily have to worry about the 313 update. You don't need to worry about the Radeon, Radeon Gallium updates. Just go out, buy yourself a cheap NVIDIA card, and you'll really thank yourself. All right. Um, IBM sells its x86 server market to Lenovo. Josh, does this matter at this point? I mean, some, because Intel is, you know, it's still a blue chip stock, it's a company with good products. Uh, certainly, Dell and HP probably ship more servers than IBM. But the, again, IBM had their niche, niche, their Nietzsche, Nietzsche. <laughs> and uh, I think they're you know, pronouncing it cloud them. now. Niche. I'll just say niche. But uh, so it's it's kind of a big deal because Lenovo seems to be buying a lot of things recently. Yeah. So x86. Uh, IBM is going totally power PC with their native products. They are also really putting more emphasis or emphasis, if that's the way you want to say it, on their software side, which uh, I think probably makes them more money yeah. in the end. Margins a little bit higher. Producing hardware is, is always kind of a losing proposition. But, you know, somebody's got to do it, and they're going to take advantage of it. But if you don't have to do it, then why bother? Interesting that uh, five and four or five days later, although it's not in the show notes, it was just just happened a little bit this afternoon. Lenovo buys Motorola from Google. Mm -hmm. So well, Lenovo is Chinese now, right? Yes. So they have all of the money. Um, so they can buy whatever they want to buy, apparently. And they have bought the x86 server market from IBM, and now the mobile handset Motorola division. Uh, from Google, that did not seem to have that for very long, unless I'm mistaken, and they didn't Two years? do anything really with Something it. Something like that. Um, well, the what, the Moto X, the one where you could customize it? Yeah, color coordination, bro. Yeah, and they could, they, could, good they could put out a specialized order in three days at that factory in Texas, which is actually kind of impressive, mm -hmm. considering the amount of handsets that they produce. Plus the people that live in Texas. Yeah, they like that. You know what I'm Perry saying? Perry likes that. Um so Lenovo buys Motorola. I don't, you know, we were talking about before, like the the yoga tablet Android devices, I already think are pretty good uh, Android-based devices, right? So like what, what, what else can they do with, uh, with the Motorola brand and the Motorola team behind them? I think it'll be pretty interesting. Lenovo is taking over. I don't care who else they buy as long as they don't screw up the ThinkPads. I'm okay with it. They can buy. And who would have thought whatever. that it's back a flip phone. in 19 it's just giant now? <laughs> yeah, back in 1995 <laughs> through 99, the StarTac flip phones were the things to have. Mm -hmm. Is that is that, is that who bought Lenovo? What? Oh 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 oh. Okay. It's the Motorola gotcha. StarTac. I thought we were going I mean, the other direction. You know, they were helping to develop uh, AMD's 180 nanometer copper process. Motorola used to be in everything, and in the last 10 years, they're 
they're kind of. I mean, they used to be at Apple for goodness sake. Yeah, Ken, sixty eight hundred series processors. Were. Ken Ken points out that they still make those sweet headsets for the coaches in the NFL. Oh, that's awesome. So they got that going for them. Yeah, which is nice. Um, uh, a, a new the Gigabyte Bricks brand continues to expand. Um, now they have the Bricks Gaming, which is uh, a similar form factor as you can see, but it uses a discrete GPU now. So this one has an AMD A8 50, uh, 5557M APU, which is a Trinity. Is that right? He says it's got which a five. One? The 5557M. That would be one of the original, yeah, Trinity mobiles. Okay, and it's coupling that with a Radeon R9 M275X mobile discrete GPU. Um, the M stands for mysterious. Well, I think yeah. it's... Um, they kind of announced this at CES, right? No, 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 no I mean they, the GPU. They, didn't. they did the, uh, the Haswell-based ones, but not the AMD. No, I mean, didn't AMD announce the mobility, like 275 and 270 and 265 or something like that? Yeah, something like that. Discrete GPU. I don't. I don't really have a whole lot of specifications about it. I think it's why the would same you as the R seven two fifty. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so it's not going to have out. It's not going to have out of this world gaming performance. But for the small form factor that you get, you're getting a discrete GPU in there, which is actually kind of cool. And maybe since this has an APU with an R seven two fifty class, maybe you can run dual graphics, man. Maybe. How? I don't know. Because they're both in there. I don't know. Maybe you they saw like the driver each other. works. I don't know. Uh, it's cool. Um, Ken wanted me to point out that uh, the was it the Main Gear Spark is this exact same system, except instead of a Gigabyte logo, it has a Main Gear logo. So I think we know who's making it. I think we have an idea. Um, I think we have a Bricks Pro incoming this week, uh, which would be a really cool device to uh, finally get to play around with. So impressed with what Gigabyte is doing in that small form factor space. Uh, and finally, our last news post of the episode is, if you are curious where all of those AMD R9 graphics cards are going, look no further than places like this. This is a... Uh, Shop card of Radeon. Pretty close. It's a Dogecoin mining rig that somebody built using six... MSI Gaming Series R9 270 graphics cards. And if you look at this photo, it's actually 70s pretty impressive. 70s or 280s? 270s, I think. Yeah, no, we found the Reddit post. This is a 270. Okay. Sorry to disappoint you. Notice that it only has one PCI Express power connection plugged in. Oh, well, there you have it. Um, so these are held up by, there's a bracket here that those are, are laying on, but then there's a zip tie through the fan housing on every uh, on every single on every single card here. You can see it right there. Um, and it's in kind of like your shelving that you get from Sam's Club or Costco or whatever uh, with an extra little bracket bolted on. This is pretty cool. On the motherboard itself, they have a um, uh, these USB 3 PCI Express risers, right? So the PCI Express port goes out to a USB 3.0 connection, and then that USB 3.0 connection goes into a daughter card, riser card that has Molex power in it so that you can actually still send power through the PCI Express bus into the graphics card. This is exquisitely done um, for not gaming, which is, I don't know, it's impressive. It's just disappointing because, you know, it's somewhere there devil's... are places like six of these where there are 290Xs across or 290s across the board. But what if Steam really does a nice job with their streaming and you can actually utilize all of those. Yeah, that'd be great. You'd have to have. You need more than Steam. You need Nvidia. Well, they don't. This is AMD. Uh, it was AMD yeah. GPU uh, virtualization technology to really get that to work. I mean, it's a really cool looking setup. Um, and, and to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. uh, at the rate he's mining on that, it's about fifty dollars a day right now. He's making fifty dollars yeah. a day. Okay. <laughs> Going to be a while towards breaking even. Yeah, I mean, each of those cards is what. 250 bucks. I'm sorry, 30 days is 1500 bucks a month. Yeah. And you add on to that a little bit maybe of electricity. $100 in electricity? Maybe. No, yeah, too it's, much. It's about $50 taking electricity out of it. 1500 oh, okay. watts oh. at, at 10 cents a kilowatt. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's if you go to if you go to our link here, we have. Oh, I'll just go ahead and click over. He's got some more just pictures um, where he shows. Uh, you know, here's the, the yeah. system. I think it was running like. 
I mean, look at the motherboard. It's got a serial port and a parallel port. Wow, on I'm it. really surprised it's an Intel board, actually. It's usually AMD boards with Semperons. It's as rock. Hell yeah, it is. These are usually AMD boards with Semperons on them. I like Semperons. Do you? Do you really? No. <laughs> It says H81 Pro motherboard that has all those. All those are PCI Express slots. I'm kind of impressed by that. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, specific I, boards. Was it ASRock that was making the mining specific boards? Some Taiwanese manufacturer Maybe. was. Maybe. You can see they do have an SSD at work. Wow. Uh, it's, all, it's all zip tied very cleanly. It's all it's all well done. You they, see all they, the they red They sprung cables. for an SSD? Wow. They probably had an extra one <laughs> sitting around, you know. Where's the network cable? Where can I get in to steal all those coins? <laughs> It's hack free, bro. No <laughs> network cable, no video, no 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 Wi Fi, no, no Wi Fi, no PS2 keyboard or mouse <laughs> associated. Um, well, it's got two USB 2.0 and two USB 3.0. This guy even left all the accessories plugged in here, like all so the caps, he so he can resell shit. these cards once. Uh, so the joke Doge is that coin it blue screened about 20 minutes after he started, and he hasn't actually checked. Oh, that'd be sad. Actually, there's one HDMI port that's uh, open up on there. So, so uh, for people looking for low cost gaming AMD Radeon cards, that's disappointing to see. But it's, I don't know, it's interesting. I guess it's not for me. If it's for you, great. Just be sure to sell those cards at a discount when you're done. I guess. That's all I got. Uh, so that's it for our news and reviews for this week. Uh, a little bit, let me check my watch here, a little bit on the short side, but that's okay. It's because we missed Alan and all of his um, monologue type discussions about storage. Maybe I want to talk about, uh, what was that hard drive? The um, I don't know. They, they, they were, they were, helium. Why would, why, helium? Why, why would somebody create a, a helium hard drive? It's a really terrible. I, I, I just don't understand why they would. You know, I, I can see that. I mean, working on a nuclear reactor, you you would <laughs> oh. some, some helium looking things no, you, in there. Trying too hard now. Um, <laughs> let's get into our hardware software picks of the week. Um, I looked around the office and found something that was sitting there that we were using that was that was that was useful. I guess um, this was the ASUS A eight A. A88X Pro. And as you can see here, this is an FM2 Plus motherboard. Um, A88, A, ugh, man, I hate that name. A88X chipset. Um, so it will support Kaveri. Um, That's our word, eh? Yes. What? Look at that gold. It's Black so much gold. gold. So much gold. It has um, dual intelligent processors, four with four way optimization, Asus Fan Expert 2, Asus USB 3. Boost, uh, UEFI BIOS with easy mode. It does have, uh, as we learned, the um, BIOS flashback capability, which turned out to be good because if you buy this and it doesn't support Kaveri out of the box, but you buy Kaveri APU, you can actually... It's a really cool feature that I hope I wish everybody would, would steal because you can update um, the BIOS without a processor and without memory. All you need is standby ATX power installed. Uh, you plug in a USB port to a specific port, hit a button on the motherboard, it reads it and flashes it. It's a pretty awesome thing uh, when you get it up and running and it works. Uh, so we're using this for some of our dual graphics testing as well as for our 7850 benchmarking that we we're running on um, after some issues with a the, with the different board uh, that we had. So uh, you can see we purchased this at Micro Center for probably a little bit. This is higher. Is this significantly higher than it was available? Let's it see. wasn't that price. Oh, you didn't pay $149.99? No. Okay. Because it's $123 on... I'm pretty sure that's about exactly okay. what it it's was. Okay, it's $123 on Amazon. Uh, and it's a pretty pretty well full-featured board. It does have VGA output, so that's good. No serial. It does have PS2, but no serial connections. Uh, who's next? I still need that damn parallel port. You do? Yeah. <laughs> no. I got to get that LPT done. Yeah. Nope. Uh, Jeremy, you're next. Well, I was going to go with the uh, food-grade pepper spray, the Blair's Ultra Death, but technically, although wonderful, not mm. really hardware. Mm. So instead, I, I Why don't you go down that, to Portland and spray that in some girl's face? Well, I'd like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's edible. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> but I figured, okay, I can come up with yet another reason why it's kind of worth moving to uh, the U.K., 
you've probably heard about British Telecom and what they were doing with their existing fiber optic networks. They did not tweak this in any way, shape, or form physically, just on software, and they're hitting 1.4 terabits a second on stuff they've already laid in the ground. Hmm. It says the network can transmit 44 uncompressed HD movies in a single second. And you can watch them all at once if you've got enough HD. I could TVs. finally fill all those six terabyte hard drives. <laughs> Unfortunately, they, they, there's only a five gigabyte data plan for the entire <laughs> month, but you know. <laughs> oh. Man. But yeah, so not, I mean, higher speed true. internet is something that the North America has fallen up so far behind on. Yeah. It's kind of nice to see that at least some people are developing a way of taking the existing infrastructure and speeding it up. And Don't not worry. having to do this huge complaint about, oh, Our we've got to dig everything up again and, you know. Yes, Australia is doing even worse than North America, but seriously. Yeah, but that's Australia. You know, yeah. you got kangaroos and stuff. Um, hey, at least we have photographic evidence of uh, Jeremy spraying the pepper sauce and that lady's face. I don't. Are you trying to get me to click a link someplace? I. <laughs> where do I do the link? Here, hold on, give hold it. Hold on. No, I got it. I got it. Hold on. You, you just got to... There you go. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, why are you wearing riot gear? She enjoys the burn. <laughs> Tell you, it's, it's about, only about a million Scoville. That stuff yeah. I pulled up is 800,000. It's about the same. Yeah, it's pretty close. It sounds stupid. Uh, Josh. Me. What are you going to finish this up on? Oh, okay. You know, I may have done this before, but it really saved my bacon this past week. So if you've ever dealt with firewalls, routers, from like Cisco, Juniper, whatever, if they go down, there's no getting it back up, really. I mean, if, if you, the, the compact flash in there is jacked, you got to wait for them to replace stuff because they don't have their software online for you to do it. But uh, PF Sense has this nice little thing. You download it. Mm -hmm. It's a great firewall. It's nice, uh, very powerful. You can configure it pretty quickly with uh, you know a little bit of study behind it. Um, it only requires we a had PTM2 a, processor. Yeah, uh, it. Uh, <laughs> we had it totally melt down. The the compact flash in it was just toast. We put a 4 gig in there. We, we connected a serial port to this uh, old uh, watch dog mm -hmm. firebox mm -hmm. 700, 750E uh, firewall. And, I mean, we were back up and running in, like, 40 minutes. And if you had had a router from somebody like Juniper or Cisco, you'd be waiting for the next day for them to get you back the stuff you need to get this back up and running, unless you paid double and had one in storage, and you could swap yeah, in. But in this case... And it's totally easy to afford Juniper and Cisco at double the price. Oh, it really, really is. So, PF Sense, uh, fantastic product. They have all kinds of add-ins you can do. They have, like, OpenVPN. Uh, you load up... Uh, their their client in there, and so when you connect to VPN on their website, you know that, that's going to your static IP. You can then download their VPN client, run that on your machine, and have a really fast and nice um, firewall that hmm. you can get for two hundred bucks, and it has all of the features of a six hundred to twelve hundred dollar unit from Cisco or Juniper. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Very neat. All right. Uh, I think, unless Alan showed up recently. No. Okay, I'm getting okay. from the control room. He's no. right there. Oh, no, there he is. He's always oh, still at the airport, I see, waiting on his flight. Uh, did they get a lot of snow and ice in uh, Washington? I think so. That's what I'm hearing. Probably. Yeah, he's going to be there for a while. That's unfortunate for him. That's, that's sad to see. Couldn't happen to a better guy. Um so I guess that's going to be it, everybody. That's the end of the, the podcast for this week. Um, if I was tired throughout this episode, uh, I did, in fact, get those two new dogs uh, last Sunday. And um, they don't sleep a lot in a row. Nope. As They're I've puppies. noticed, they don't sleep a lot in a row. They sleep a lot, but they'll be like 45 minutes at a time. 
So that makes it difficult for a human adult to kind of synchronize a, a sleep schedule with it. But uh, uh, we're fighting through it. And we, we still have uh, a bunch of stuff going up on the site. And uh, I think if you stick around, the, the, the rest of this week will be interesting from a hardware perspective. If, say, you are interested in AMD uh, API technologies, let's just say that would maybe be the case. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm not going to say good or bad. I'm just going to say interesting and leave it at that. Uh, if you want to watch uh, uh, us record this show live, you can do so on Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific at pcper.com slash live. Or like I mentioned before, if you go to pcper.com slash, slash subscribe, you can sign up uh, for our mailing list there, which all we do is use it to send you notifications when we go live. And of course, if you missed uh, previous episodes, you can find them all at pcper.com slash podcast or you can find the video versions on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash PC per. Um, I guess that's it uh, for this week, everybody. We will we'll be back in seven short days. Seven short days. That math checks out. Maybe wow, not good. only did we kind of start on time, we're finishing on time. Yeah, I know. If you would let me actually get to the conclusion, we could we could have done it. Now it's screwed up. Now we're huh. going to go back and edit all of this. I love it when a plan comes together. Yeah. 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 Indeed. I'm Ryan Schrupp. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. And I'm Josh Walrath. Are we going to show Al? There he is. Bye, Alan. Bye, Alan. Bye, Alan. He's not waiting. Bye, Unabomber. Bye, Unabomber.